Canon Knox, members of Moore College, ladies and gentlemen. I've been very kindly introduced. I would like to begin by saying how glad I am to be here, how much it, I count it a privilege to be speaking at this Moore College annual lecture series, especially when I realize that I'm in succession to Professor Bruce, whom we regard as the Doya, the senior man, and in a very, in a very real sense, the Alp of learning uh, on the evangelical side in our own country. It's a joy to be back in Australia again. I was here nine years ago. I was at Moore College, in fact, nine years ago. And it's good to come back and see that the work here still goes on. Canon Knox my old friend still goes on, <laughs> and uh, one gets the feeling that uh, in the Diocese of Sydney, at least as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't say that in any snide way. Coming from England, where the habit of the Church of England is to change everything every year and to pull up everything to see whether it's, going about, whether it's growing about three times a year, it really is rather a comfort and encouragement to come to a place where things are stable. To me, it's a real refreshment of spirit and a great pleasure for that reason alone to be here, quite apart from other factors. There are other factors. There are old friends here to greet and all kinds of things which make my visit to Sydney a source of great pleasure to me. But I'm not here to talk to you in this general chatty way, I'm here to give a lecture on the title that's just been announced to you, and may I, without more ado, give myself to this task. We've a story to tell. That's my title, and We Preach Christ Crucified is my overarching theme. Said Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 and 24, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, scandal on, to the Gentiles, folly, moria, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Here we have the apostle setting his gospel in antithesis to two first century forms of intellectual self-assertion. Two attitudes revealed as self-assertion by the questions which they asked about the gospel and by their reactions to it. By these, the questions and the reactions, you shall know them. There was the attitude first of the Jews. The Jews require a sign, says Paul. What does that mean? That the Jews were hard-headed realists, unwilling to advance a step beyond evidence? No, it means nothing of the kind. It means that the Jews were showing themselves unreasonable skeptics. The sign which the Jews required in those days was a type of evidence which we may describe as miracles and magic to order. The second temptation which had been put to our Lord Jesus Christ in the wilderness had taken the form of an invitation to provide miracles and magic to order. You remember? Throw yourself down from a pinnacle of the temple and get up unhurt at the bottom and you'll wow them. That was the essence of the temptation, and Jesus had refused it. He was not gathering support, not gathering followers on that basis. And so we read in Mark chapter 8, verse 11 and following, that when the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him, he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. 
and he left them, it says. This, I say again, is really skepticism, masquerading as interest. But at bottom, it's an attitude of unwillingness to believe. What is being demanded, miracles and magic to order, as we said a moment ago, is something which it is arrogant and arbitrary to demand in a situation where abundant signs had already been given. That's what we have to grasp. In the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, as those who watched it saw it, and as it was reported by the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians and others, abundant signs had been given already. Do you remember how in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 11, we are told of the messengers who came from John the Baptist languishing in prison to ask the Lord Jesus, are you he who should come or should we be looking for someone else? And this was John's question. Some of the things that Jesus had been doing and even more perhaps things that Jesus had not been doing had surprised John. John's idea, based on the way that God had prompted him to herald the coming Messiah, was that as soon as Jesus' ministry began, catastrophic things would begin to happen. Acts of judgment, acts of traumatic import for the life of the nation. And Jesus had not been ministering in that way. Hence the question, are you he who should come? the one whose fan is in his hand to purge his floor, or are we to look for someone else? And do you remember how Jesus replied to John's question? The message that he sent back through John's disciples was this. Go and tell John the things that you see and hear. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Go and tell John that those things are happening and say to him, blessed is he who shall not be offended, caused to stumble. It's a word from this same root from which scandal on comes. Blessed is he who shall not be caused to stumble at me. Blessed is he who discerns the meaning of the signs that are being given in my ministry and is prepared to trust me concerning those matters where I haven't fulfilled his expectations. But the signs that had been given were the decisive ones. For what Jesus meant John to pick up was this, that here was being fulfilled what Isaiah long ago had prophesied. We know the words well, they're in the 35th chapter of the prophecy, and Handel set them to memorable music in the Messiah. Then shall the eyes of the blind be opened, Isaiah had predicted, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. That's how it shall be in the day when God visits his people to bless them. Yes, the signs had been given. And a further sign was to be given, Jesus refers to that at, in the opening verses of Matthew chapter 16, where again we find him asked for a sign. The Pharisees and Sadducees came, and to test him they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. And he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign shall be given it except the sign of Jonah. And elsewhere, he'd interpreted that reference as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so the Son of Man shall be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And after that, not. After that, alive again. The sign of resurrection was to be given to confirm the witness borne by those miraculous healings and works of mercy which Jesus did during his three-year ministry in Galilee. 
The signs had been given. That's the point to grasp. But the Jews who heard the story still sought a sign. They wouldn't accept the signs that had been given because they'd not been given to order. The Jews, you might say, demanded to call the shots, to specify what sign should be given and where, to make God, as it were, dance to their tune. I say again, this is frivolous skepticism. It's an expression of dysfunctional unbelief. Can't believe in this situation means won't believe. The Jews unreasonably require a sign. Many signs are being given which already, they, which already they're ignoring. Jesus put his finger on dispositional unbelief, resolute skepticism, when in Luke 16 and verse 31, at the end of his story of the rich man and Lazarus, he said this, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one should rise from the dead. And I don't think that needs any explanatory comment from me. The Greeks, Paul continued, seek after wisdom. What does that mean? Is the quest for wisdom a sign of great and superior intelligence? Doubtless the Greeks themselves would have insisted that it was, for they regarded themselves as folk of great and superior intelligence. But we have to say no. This, in, this request for wisdom is not that. It's a mark, rather, of evasive intellectualism, which is something rather different. What was the wisdom which they asked Paul to provide? What they were seeking was a type of communication to which they were accustomed and in which they were interested. And probably there are two things in mind here as Paul speaks. Some Jews sought philosophical speculations on the world and life and things, speculations based on flights of audacious reason. Others of these Jew Greeks were doubtless seeking the kind of gnosis, inside knowledge, that was offered by the mystery cults. That too was often called wisdom in the first century AD. What it consisted of was the provision of occult secrets, giving power, supernatural power, putting the adherent of the mystery cult in the know, regarding all kinds of what were supposed to be spiritual mysteries, making him feel, therefore, that he was one of the spiritual elite. And these were the two types of wisdom which they were asking Paul to provide. What are we to say of the Jews and the Greeks, as Paul describes them? Why this? That they correspond perfectly to well-known and familiar modern types. Here are attitudes which are very far from dead. You have met the man who says, I want scientific facts, I want scientific proof before I'll believe, and he reserves the right to designate what he'll regard as scientific proof and what he will not regard as scientific proof. And that man is the spiritual successor of the Jews. And similarly, you have met the man who says, I am a man of reason, I am guided by reason, I steer by truths of reason. Whatever you have to say to me, you must present to me as a truth of reason, or I shan't take it seriously and you can't expect me to. And that man is the spiritual descendant of the Greek. And neither the Jew type nor the Greek type is willing to take things from God by revelation. And this was the controversy which the gospel raises and which Paul in his testimony had constantly to pursue in the world to which he went. For Paul went proclaiming what in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 he calls the word of the cross. 
We preach Christ crucified, he said. Now, this certainly was a startling thing for any man to say. Christ, that's a title, an office title, as Presbyterians would say. The Christ is God's anointed world ruler. The one whom Paul, in the first ten verses of this chapter, had referred to six times, no less than six times, as the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus the personal name, Christ the office title, and Lord the standard title in the ancient world given to folk who ought to be worshipped. And Christ, says Paul, we preach as crucified. That is, we proclaim that he was executed as an outlaw because it was only the outlaws who were crucified in the ancient world. It was capital punishment for grave offense, offenses and civil rebellion. And you can see how paradoxical and startling that sounds. And you can see too how humbling a message it is as Paul explains it. For if you asked Paul, what it meant that Christ, the anointed world ruler whom God had designated, um, <clears throat> whom God had designated to have been crucified, Paul's reply was, as indeed you find it in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, there was no way in which man could be brought to God save that the Christ should die for his sins. For every man has sins that need to be forgiven, and no man by his own endeavor, endeavors can put those sins away. But when Paul preached his message of Christ crucified, his word of life and hope for the world, immediately it gave offense to the Jews. For first, it cheapened their own private messianic hopes, and second, it suggested that God was weak in allowing the Messiah to go to the cross. Paul speaks ironically in verse 25 of the weakness of God, obviously echoing the things that Jewish critics said about his message. It does make God appear weak, and it does focus on the putting away of sin, which to the ordinary Jew, trusting as he was, in the sacrifices offered in the temple seemed simply an irrelevant message. And similarly, when Paul preached of Christ crucified to, to the Greeks, it, it seemed nonsense and they said so. Paul is obviously echoing ironically the things that Greeks said when he speaks in verse 25 of the foolishness of God. This is a very silly story said his Greek critics. And to them, too, the message of the putting away of sin by the death of the Messiah seemed irrelevant to their own felt needs. And so they rejected the message. And, says Paul, this is the reaction of those whom, in verse 18, he describes as perishing. When he uses that word, his language is clinical rather than emotional. He's using the word because it expresses the thought that he wants to convey. That which is perishing, according to the dictionary me meaning of the Greek word apolumi that's being used here, is that which is becoming incapable of its intended function. And that is the thought here, that men who were made for fellowship with God are showing themselves incapable of it, and confirming themselves in that very incapacity by their resolute rejection of the word of the cross. But Paul contrasts with the negative reaction of those who are perishing, the positive reaction of those whom he describes as called, verse 24, and those who are being saved, verse 18. And to them, he says, the message is the good word of Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, 
the power of God for part of the message is the proclaiming of his resurrection and his reign and his power in the regeneration of sinners and his power as the world is to see it at his return. And the message of Christ crucified is a proclamation of the wisdom of God for, as Paul goes on to say in verse 30, Christ of God is made to us believers wisdom, meaning the way to God, and righteousness, a just justification, which only divine wisdom could have devised, and sanctification, which in this verse certainly means a covenant relationship or a means of covenant relationship with God. It means that before it means anything else. And so redemption, full salvation from sin, Christ is made to us all those things in the sense that we have them all in him. And this is the wisdom of God par excellence, says Paul, for this is God in Christ providing us with all that we need for that life for which we were made and for which sin has unfitted us. So Paul, in this passage, as often elsewhere in his writings, draws out the antithesis between faith and unbelief, between the reaction to the gospel of those who are alive and to whom, therefore, it comes as a savor of life for life, and those who are spiritually dead, to whom, therefore, the gospel comes as a savor of death unto death. And the point I want to make, and this is the, a point which I'm laboring because it sets the perspective that we shall be exploring throughout these, let these lectures, the point that I want to underline is that the antithesis continues it continues as the gospel confronts the modern world, and it continues, alas, as the gospel confronts a great deal that goes on in the modern church. For the spiritual descendants of the Jews and the, G the Greeks of Paul's day have, alas, got into the modern church, at least in principle and in their thought forms. The movement, which used to be called liberalism or modernism, and is now frequently called radicalism in Christian theology, manifests the same pride of mind. I stress here that I'm speaking of the intellectual method of the movement rather than the motives of any particular individuals caught up in it. I'm speaking not of individuals, but of ways of thinking the movement, I say, manifests the same pride of mind, the same arbitrary skepticism, the same evasive intellectualism, as you saw in the Jews and the Greeks of Paul's day. Still, we have the arbitrary skeptics who believe that they're in a position to tell us that such realities as incarnation and resurrection cannot be, and we shall be making reference as we go along to that unhappy book, The Myth of God Incarnate, published in England, in, in English by a number of university theologians last year, which is just one of the latest expressions of this position, but its title, as you see, tells all at this point. Still, too, you have the evasive intellectualism which refuses to take seriously the fact that God has revealed himself in history and insists on turning Jesus Christ, as proclaimed in the gospel, into an idea, a myth, a symbol, a memory, an image, an influence, but which refuses to allow that his status is that of a divine personal savior. And those who do their thinking within the lines set by this movement 
are obliged in consequence to change the Christian message so that it's no longer an invitation from a living savior in the terms of Matthew 11, 28 and following. Come to me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and you shall find rest for your souls. No longer can they think of becoming a Christian in the terms in which Paul spells it out in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where he says that the Thessalonian converts turn from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, Jesus, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. No, their gospel is rather a matter of come under an influence within the church than it is a matter of come to a living Savior and a mighty Lord. And they reconceive the Christian mission Inevitably and inescapably, they must do this as not so much the task of introducing folk the world over to Jesus Christ the Lord, as it's a matter of going out to the other religions to enrich them. That was the 19th century way of envisaging the Christian, the Christian mission. You take insights from the world of Christian thinking to make Buddhism into better Buddhism, Hinduism into better Hinduism, and so on. And the, the counterpart of that in this late 20th century is the reconceiving of mission in terms of humanization, going out in order to identify with the secular ambitions and desires and concerns of the nations and to help them forward in their desires for political liberty, economic stability, and so on, Humanization, as it's nowadays called, you will know that there's a great deal of thinking of this kind in the World Council of Churches. And all this is opposed, you see, to the preaching of the living, reigning Christ, crucified and alive forevermore. And the message is no longer presented in ter the terms in which Paul presented it to the Philippian jailer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Jesus, according to this gospel, is an example and an influential memory in the church, but precisely not a living savior and friend here and now in the present tense. And in the church, we have to fight the conflict constantly with liberalism, just as we have to fight the good fight against unbelief in the world. Well, this is the situation into which these lectures of mine are being spoken. What we're going to do together, God enabling us, is to rethink and restate the essential gospel, the scriptural gospel, in the light of some of these modern trends, in the light of some of these latter-day modern movements. We are going to look at alternatives to scriptural positions. We are going to consider what can be said in favor of them and what has to be said against them. And thus, I hope we may, through God's grace, keep the gospel from being overlaid with misbelief in our own minds and equip ourselves to proclaim the gospel all the more clearly to others. For the rest of my time this evening, I propose to consider this as the first of the series of questions that we'll be exploring what sort of a message, what sort of good news, what sort of a communication is the gospel anyway? What sort of instruction is the word of the cross, the proclaiming of Christ crucified? I could answer that question by saying, the proclamation is essentially the declaring of a series of doctrines. I have, in fact, answered the question that way in print before now. If you look at my book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, you'll find me saying that the preaching of the gospel, the message of the gospel, concerns five realities, all themes of Christian doctrine, 
God and his holiness, man and his sin, Christ and his cross, his atonement, faith and repentance, and fifthly, the Holy Spirit and new life. Putting it that way, I would be answering the question by saying, the gospel is an orthodoxy. And that answer would not be false. What are doctrines? They are distillations of scriptural lines of thought for teaching purposes. The Latin word doctrina means teaching. As such, doctrines are, so to speak, ring fences round the reality of God at work. Creeds and confessions are similarly ring fences round the reality of God at work. Creeds and confessions consist of doctrines. And when I say ring fences, I hope I'm conveying my picture clearly. Within the area marked off by the ring fence, one must look, one must dig, one must explore, if one is going to grasp the truth. Outside that area, whatever notions one finds will not be the truth. Doctrines are needed to circumscribe the truth. Doctrines are given us by God the teacher himself. Doctrines are necessary in the church because God has given doctrines to the church. God himself, through his messengers, has taught us the truth. Therefore, doctrines must be formulated and doctrines must be valued. For God himself has become our teacher. What is in the Bible is doctrine and so it should be presented. I say these things in order to convince you, if such convincing were necessary, that I am not in any sense against doctrines. Indeed, in England, I'm, I find myself in many circles something of a speckled bird by reason of my enthusiasm for doctrines. But yet, what I want to say tonight is that to answer the question, what essentially, what sort of message is the gospel? by saying the gospel consists of doctrines would be a limited answer because doctrines, as we receive them and as we preserve them and as we state them, are defensive, often abstract, as formerly static. And we have to remind ourselves that we are not saved, nor do we come to know God, simply by being orthodox and being able to rattle off the doctrines. In my book, Knowing God, I make rather a song and dance about that too, that there is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God, and that knowing about God is only the means to knowing God just as knowing about a person in this world is hopefully the means of subsequently coming into a relationship with them based on an awareness and understanding of who and what they are. So tonight I don't want to answer the question by saying the gospel is essentially a proclaiming of doctrines, true though that answer would be. I prefer for tonight to answer the question like this. What sort of communication is the gospel? Answer, it's a story. It's a story told about God. Ultimately, in as much as it's a matter of revelation, it's a story about God told to us by God. It's a story in which God, through his spokesmen, bears witness to himself. And the theme of the story is precisely the living God at work in this world, in the past, in the present, and in the future. It's the story, I mean, of what God has done, is doing, and will do. Here I note that in the scriptures, 
and also in what I'm saying now. The word gospel is a concertina word, sometimes used with a narrower range of meaning, as when the concertina is closed up, and sometimes used with a wider range of meaning, as when the concertina is opened. Christ crucified is the heart of the matter, whether the words used in the narrower or in the broader sense. In the narrower sense, the gospel means the area covered by those five doctrines that I mentioned thus just now, and the work God does, shall I say, the work God has done as men's savior on the cross, and that he does in bringing men through faith to know him now, and that he will do as he leads men on in that life which the Holy Spirit gives. Taking the word gospel, however, in the broader sense, which it also bears in scripture, it signifies nothing less than the whole counsel of God, that whole divine plan which began in eternity and will only be completed in eternity, from eternity to eternity, the plan of salvation not completed until the church is perfect in glory. I am using the word now in the wider sense rather than in the narrower sense, as you will see but I have scripture precedent for what I'm doing. The gospel, I'm saying, is essentially a story, a narrative about God. We may learn this from our hymns, this way, I mean, of looking at the matter. Hymns take us again and again to the heart of Christianity, although sometimes in naive fashion, you might think that the missionary hymn, which I'm just about to quote, is naive in some ways. Nonetheless, it makes this point for me admirably, as I think. It is the hymn that provided the title of this lecture. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and sweetness, a story of peace and light. We have a message to give to the nations that the Lord that who reigneth above has sent us his Son to save us and show us that God is love. Or again, with equal naivety but with equal truth, we may look at the children's hymn, Tell Me the Old, Old Story of Unseen Things Above, of Jesus and His Glory, of Jesus and His Love. Tell me the story slowly that I may take it in, God's wonderful redemption, his remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, if you would really be in any time of trouble, a comforter to me. The story, yes, exactly. The hymns are right. You can get the same message from the theologians. Take the late Karl Barth. In the 20s, he was insisting already that his purpose as a theologian was to focus on the simple points of Christian truth. And in the 70s, touring America for the last time, he was asked by some American wiseacre what was the profoundest thought that he'd ever had. And he answered by quoting from the children's hymn, Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. And it was Karl Barth who, right at the end of his life, summed up his whole theological endeavor in the 7,000 pages of the Church Dogmatics and the seven or 8,000 other pages that he wrote under other titles. He summed up the whole purpose of his theological endeavor as the making of this one point that we should learn, he says, to see grace as revelation and revelation as story. Story. That, as Karl Barth saw, it was the heart of the matter. And so the Bible itself presents the matter too. Here is Paul at the beginning of Romans chapter 1. Paul wrote Romans as his great elaborate, full-dress exposition of the gospel. And he started it almost ceremonially with a great full-dress sentence announcing the subject of the letter. And the sentence reads like this. 
Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and designated son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we've received grace and apostleship, and so on and so on. But I needn't read further. You see what the Paul is announcing? The gospel, the good news, concerning his son, a historical personage descended from David according to the flesh, who rose from the dead, Jesus Christ the Lord. This is history. This is a story of what God has done. And break it with that, the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul recalls the Corinthians to basics, saying, Now I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preach to you the gospel which you received and in which you stand and by which you're saved. I delivered to you as a first impulse what I also received, namely this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared, and so on. What is? Again, we have to say, this is story, this is narrative, this is history. This is a proclamation of what God has done. And you don't need me, do you, to remind you that in the letter to the Romans, Paul moves from what God has done to what God is doing in giving life to those who have faith in Christ and what God will do in perfecting the church. Remember how Romans 11, Romans 11 paints that glorious vision of the church finally finally complete Jew and Gentile together in the one body and God all in all. You don't need me to remind you how in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul moves from looking back to Jesus' death and resurrection into the present, the forgiveness of sins, which those who believe in the resurrection have, and into the future, the Christian hope of resurrection someday when the trumpet sounds and the dead are raised. This is the gospel the declaration, the story of God's work, past, present, and future. In the book of the Acts, in the sermons in the book of the Acts, C.H. Dodd, nearly 50 years ago, found the apostolic preaching, the characteristic kerygma, recurring again and again as men proclaimed the fulfilling of prophecy in the life and death and resurrection the present reign and the future return of Jesus Christ the Lord. Yes, all the way through the New Testament, the gospel is declared as history. And let's not pussyfoot around this word history, as so many scholars today or less do. When I speak of history, I mean the space-time continuum within which you and I are found at 10 to 9 on this um, Tuesday evening in uh, September 1978, and which has been continuous since the world was made. History is the public stage of that space-time continuum, and the events which we are speaking of and which the New Testament record, records took place within that space-time continuum. And this story, the nature of this story, can be characterized by saying, in principle, if we could travel back through time with H.G. Wells' time traveler in the time machine, or with the modern Doctor Who in his phone box, we could, in principle, stand with those who listened to Jesus' preaching in Galilee long ago, stand with those who watched him die on the cross, stand with the women and the disciples at the empty tomb on the third day. These things happened 
And in principle, if we could travel back in time, we could have shared in the event ourselves. We could have witnessed what others, in fact, witness. It's in this simple, straightforward, basic sense that we say these things proclaimed in the gospel are history. For the apostles themselves clearly and unambiguously so regard them. The gospel, let me say it again, is history, its story, its narrative of what God has done in the space-time continuum and does still and will do until history reaches its end. The Bible narrates this story by ringing the changes on various key themes which in different places of scripture become focal points for the telling of the story. The gospel, we might say, is like a rope made up of a number of strands woven together and each of these different presentations of the gospel is just one of those strands. But the gospel in its fullness isn't before us until the strands have been woven together, until the whole rope, we might say, has been constructed. What you say are the separate strands? Well, you can tell the story first as the story of God's kingdom. The story of how God expressed his unchanging kingship, his sovereignty over his world, by bringing that world, following man's initial rebellion, back into actual submission to his rule once again, and the actual enjoyment of the saving mercy, the gift of eternal life, which those who submit to God's rule come to know. The story begins with man's rebellion and consequent loss of spiritual life in the Garden of Eden. It goes on to show how God made himself king, first over his own people Israel, how having, how, I'm sorry, how he set up a monarchy to rule in his place over his people Israel, how through the prophets he established in the minds of his people the hope of a greater king, a son of David who should be David's Lord, who was later to come. How his son came into the world to be that king, Jesus the Christ. How following his crucifixion and resurrection, he became king, reigning in heaven at the Father's right hand and how one day he is coming in his kingdom, finally to establish in a public and open way that dominion which is already his, albeit unacknowledged for the most part by men. This is the story of God's kingdom and of Jesus Christ the King in that kingdom. And this is one of the strands in the gospel story. And in spelling out this strand of the scriptural message, we shall pay special attention to the history books of Scripture, Old and New Testament, to many messianic passages in Old Testament prophecy, and to the first three Gospels in the New, of the New Testament in particular, all of which dwell on this theme. But then a, stra a second strand, you can tell the Gospel story in terms of the theme of God's people. The theme, I mean, of how God is fulfilling his purpose of having a people, creating a people, who shall live in fellowship with himself, worshipping him and witnessing to him, glorifying him and enjoying him both now and forever, this story begins in eternity with the three who are one resolving to have men in their fellowship. And then on the stage of time, the story goes on to tell us how God chose Abram and Abram's seed to be his people. How he called Abram's family out of Egypt 
and in the wilderness, made them his people by covenant, and established worship, a pattern of priesthood and sacrifice to ensure that fellowship between them should always be an experienced reality and nothing should block it. The story would go on to tell how he taught Israel to live in fellowship with him. The story continue through to Jesus Christ, the true Israel, the seed of Abram in, in his own person in whom Israel is reconstituted. The story would go on to show how the New Testament church is in fact the new and true Israel in Jesus Christ. And the story would end with spelling out the nature of the new community which God by his grace has brought into being. The church as the people of God, the church as the body of Christ, and the church as the community of the Spirit. The church as the third race in this world, the international society with a heavenly life. The church as the company of those who know the forgiveness of sins, fellowship with God by grace, through faith, and eternal life now. And for the telling of the story in this way, we should draw most heavily on Exodus and Deuteronomy and Hosea, perhaps, in the Old Testament, and books like Galatians and Ephesians and Revelation in the New Testament. And in connection with the story, the general story of God making, God creating a people, we should tell as part of it, or perhaps a separate theme, the story of mediation, the story of God's special work of grace to create fellowship between sinners and himself. We should tell the story of how God first set up a typical priesthood and sacrifice and place of access in order to teach his people that there was a need for mediation and how the pattern of mediation came finally to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is both the, our great high priest and the one perfect sacrifice for sins for all God's people for all time, and who, by his sacrifice, has substituted for that tabernacle, followed by the temple in Jerusalem, the particular locality where men were told to worship God, the situation, the state of affairs in which any men, any time may call upon God through Jesus Christ and find themselves in his presence with his mediation effective, he bringing them to God and keeping them in fellowship with God. Uh, this is the story of mediation. The pattern is spelled out in Exodus and Leviticus. The reality is spelled out in the Gospel of John and Galatians and Romans and most of all in Hebrews, where we are shown how Jesus fulfills in his own person and by his sacrifice this pattern, this picture of mediation. So there is a further strand in the story, the theme of God's mediation, for it is indeed God taking the initiative here and doing it all, God's mediation, whereby he brings sinners into fellowship with himself. So there's a third strand, God's kingdom, God's people, God's mediation, we've already looked at. A fourth strand in the gospel story is the theme of renewal, the renewal of the world the renewal of a disordered creation. Morally disordered through the revolt of Satan and the consequent revolt of men, and cosmically disordered, as Paul indicates, without going into details, in the middle of Romans chapter 8. But disorder has not come to stay. This strand of the gospel message proclaims that Satan and his adherents, both angelic and human, are, di are doomed. Their revolt cannot last forever. Satan is a defeated foe. He will be judged. Those who side with him will be judged. 
By contrast, those who put their faith in God through Christ are already being renewed, inwardly renewed in heart and spirit and character. One day they will be outwardly renewed by being given bodies to match in resurrection. And on that day, the whole cosmos will be renewed. There will be new heaven and new earth, and the glory of God will finally and fully be shown forth throughout the cosmos as the waters cover the sea. And this way of telling the gospel story is a proclamation of divine victory by stages over sin and the disorder that sin has created. And for telling the gospel story in this way, passages of special relevance are Genesis 3, Romans 8, much in Isaiah, 2 Peter chapter 3, much in Revelation, and so on. And this isn't all. Fifthly, you can tell the story as the story of the glorifying of God's Son. You can announce it and present it in terms of the Father's purpose to honor and make, make known his Son as co-creator, as redeemer, as head of the church, as the source of life to sinners, as the world's present Lord and coming King, and as the one whom men are to worship and honor as they honor the Father. And looked at from this standpoint, the gospel becomes an invitation to bow down and worship Jesus Christ. And the scripture passages specially relevant for telling the story in this way are the Gospel of John, I suppose, and the letter to the Colossians, and again, much in the book of Revelation. Or sixthly, one can tell the story in, as the proclamation of the perfecting of man. The perfecting of man, I mean in God's image. One can tell the story in terms of man and the problem which he raises and which he presents to himself and in terms of the solution that God, the God who made him, provides to that problem. The problem is, who am I? Why am I here? Whence did I come? Where am I going? And God's answer as revealed in the gospel is that every man was made to be godlike. Every man was made to live in the image of God and in fellowship with God. I believe that biblical theology teaches us to see the image of God as destiny, no less than endowment. It was both the one and the other. As endowment, as we see man made in the image of God in Genesis chapter 1, the image consists of rationality, the capacity to make plans and carry them through, creativity, Dominion, spiritual knowledge, knowledge of divine reality, and with that, righteousness, holiness. I can prove all those things, I think, from Genesis chapter 1. Surely it's right exegesis and theology to understand the image of God in Genesis chapter 1, first and foremost in terms of the presentation of God in Genesis chapter 1, and rationality, creativity, dominion, knowledge, and holiness are the qualities which God in Genesis 1 is shown as manifesting. But man's destiny was to live in a way which uh, in, in a way which exhibited God-likeness every moment and in every activity for the whole of human life. And in that sense, likeness to God was man's destiny. And of course, Adam fell, and so his destiny wasn't fulfilled. But the New Testament picks up the theme and proclaims the image of God as restored in Christ through union with Christ, Union with Christ is another of the great gospel themes. And you have Paul in Genesis, sorry, you have Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, speaking of the gospel as a summons to put on the new man, which is renewed, um, with, sorry, 
put on the new man which is created after the likeness of God, the image of God, we might say, for that's what likeness means, created after the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. And similarly, Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, speaks of Christians as having put on the new man, which is being renewed in knowledge, knowledge of God and all that that entails after the image of its creator. And everything that the New Testament has to say about God's gift to man in Christ of the holiness which he requires is in truth part of the theme of the restoring in man of God's image as his destiny. And this is yet another strand in the gospel story, yet another way in which that gospel story can be told. 